And so much of the conversation among the financial insiders throughout this this uh, GameStop brouhaha has been about how, oh, it's absurd that the price skyrocketed because obviously the company isn't valued accurately. It's absurd because obviously this is like a blockbuster style company that's completely out of business. And there's all this conversation about value, value, value. And the counterpoint is that nothing is being appropriately valued. I mean, obviously this was, you know, an inflation, but that the overarching problem in all, all of these crises, it seems the instability is driven by the fact that one, the, the financial markets are so complex, even to people who are on the inside of them, that there's a lot of opportunity for three card Monty to continue all the gambling metaphors. <laughs> and two, that it's just very difficult to appropriately and accurately value something. I, mean, I remember when I started as a paralegal after college um, at a boutique firm, I was doing a lot of this work. We were told 11 people in the world understand this financial instrument you're working with. You're responsible to, you're supposed to be the 12th. And, you know, we were supposed to, you know, think this was, you know, heady stuff and feel really good about ourselves for having these you know, explainer books heaped on our desk as we try desperately to figure it out as, as you know, overpaid paralegals. But there was this sense that even though other people at the firm, even other people in the industry didn't know what was going on. And lo and behold, about six months after I started working there, we had the financial crisis. <laughs> yeah, great job, Brie. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> yeah, like um, those... Uh, those points that you were making at the beginning about um, value. Mm -hmm. Like it, it it brings back this central question that neoclassical econ economics doesn't have an answer to, that mm -hmm. mainstream economics doesn't have an answer to, which is what is value? Mm -hmm. Now, Marxists have an answer to that. It's hotly debated. And, you know, you'll find a lot of people with very, very different interpretations about what the labor theory of value is, how applicable, how applicable it is, even whether Marx actually did have a labor theory of value. But Marxists have an understanding of where profits come from, how profits are generated in the production process. For the neoclassical economist, there is just this sense that prices and value are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Value is just an expression of how much you want something, how much mm -hmm. utility something gives you. And so it becomes very difficult to disentangle value from price. Mm -hmm. And this becomes, uh, you know, challenging in, in ordinary commodity markets, but in financial markets, it's very, very difficult. Um, obviously, asset prices are governed by different uh, different kind of logics than commodity prices. But the, the point remains, you know, it's, it's difficult to wade into a financial market and say, this thing is not as valuable as everyone else thinks it is because financial markets are supposed to be efficient. And indeed, that's usually how a lot of hedge funds make a lot of money. It's by wading into the books, by, you know, potentially doing some dodgy stuff to like figure out what's really going on inside a company um, and saying, actually, everyone else is wrong. This is not valuable. This is, you know, not going to produce any profit over the long run. Um, but Generally, you know, the, the cases in which that happens and is done successfully is is rare because, you know, markets are supposed to be efficient allocators of, cap allocators of capital. They're supposed to give you an, an indication as to the future profitability of all these companies. But not everything is a, is, is a juicer. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a it's a guess. Yeah. Also, as Doug Henwood points out, the, what mark another thing that the stock market is supposed to do is is raise funds for companies right and he pointed out that something like three percent of the the money that private firms raise just come from actual stock offerings and the rest of it you know just comes from other sources yeah so like firms can raise money in loads of different ways they can issue so they can issue stock obviously but stock is generally not preferred because um it like firstly it conveys um ownership as well generally like most kinds of stock if you buy the stock then you're a part owner of that company so you can potentially influence the the decisions that are being made by that company uh, but also because obviously if you're issuing more stock then it's diluting the value of the existing stock so it's making you know the people who currently own that stock less wealthy they can also issue bonds um, which is kind of borrowing from financial markets they can borrow from banks um, yeah, there's lots of different ways that that, um, that corporations can um, can raise funds, and this differs from place to place. So, like uh, the US and the UK have much more developed and sophisticated capital markets that firms rely on than other parts of the world that rely more on bank financing. It's like a lot of places in Europe rely more on bank financing, and there are some interesting questions there as to um, you know how 
capital markets could be used uh, theoretically by a kind of um, socialist or progressive government to direct capital more effectively and more efficiently, whether you're talking about sustainability, whether you're talking about equity. But broadly, yeah, broadly speaking, um, this particular attempt to kind of privately influence the direction of of capital allocation in favour of a small number of, of retail investors was, I think, probably, um, yeah, not a model for organising or for direct action. Mm-hmm.